Hello, my name is James Robson, and I'm the Victor and William Fung Director of the Harvard Asia Center. And I wanted to welcome everyone to this director's conversation with Professor Ginny Sutgerson, the John H. Weston Jr. Professor of Law in the Harvard Law School, where she has taught constitutional law, criminal law and procedure, family law, and the law of art, fashion, and the performing arts. Before joining the faculty in 2006, she served as a law clerk to Justice David Souter in the United States Supreme Court and to Judge Harry Edwards on the U.S. Court of Appeals in the D.C. Circuit. Her book, At Home in the Law, was awarded the Law and Society Association's Herbert Jacob Prize for the Best Law and Society Book of the Year. She's been a Guggenheim Fellow and a recipient of the Harvard Law School's Sachs Friend Award for Teaching Excellence. She's also a contributing writer to The New Yorker. So thank you very much for joining me today in this discussion of an important and difficult issue, which touches on ongoing concerns and debates about the so-called comfort women system, issues of legal contracts, uh, Japan and Korea relations, including also US relations, as well as issues of academic freedom versus academic integrity. These issues came to the fore recently with the publication of an article by Professor J. Mark Ramsire, the Mitsubishi Professor of Japanese Legal Studies in the Harvard Law School, entitled Contracting for Sex in the Pacific War, that was published online in the International Review of Law and Economics in December of 2020 and slated for print publication uh, this March. But it began to receive much critical attention in mid-January of this year after receiving attention in the media in Korea and Japan. And it has also included, uh, in addition to Professor Gerson's article in the New Yorker, also an article in the New York Times. So thank you very much again. I'm grateful for you to take the time today uh, to join me and help unravel some of these issues. So just about a week ago on February 26 of 2021, uh, you published an article entitled Seeking the True Story of the Comfort Women how a Harvard professor's dubious scholarship reignited a history of mistrust between South Korea and Japan. And I wonder if you could initiate our discussion by situating the current controversy regarding that article. Uh, in other words, how does it fit into the larger historical and evolving issues related to the comfort women? And also a little bit of background of just how you came to write that article. Thank you, James. I'm really um, glad to be having this conversation with you. I, I do agree that this is a very important issue. It, it touches on a lot of different kinds of things right now that collide um, at this moment in time. And it is something that came to my attention in late January um, when my students and alumni of Harvard Law School started to suddenly email me and text me about an article that my colleague Mark Ramsire had written, and actually two articles, one was in a scholarly journal and the other one was in a publication called Japan Forward in Japan, but written in English. And they really were very clear about denying that comfort women were enslaved, coerced, forced, or deceived into doing sex work for the Japanese army during World War II. And it was very, very clear that what he was saying was that that account was pure fiction um, and that historians and everyone else had gotten it wrong and that Japan needed to have a, a different stance with respect to it, stop being apologetic or, or, or taking responsibility, but instead to try to, what he said was to try to tell the truth. And so in his view, he was debunking false claims by saying that the comfort women system was one that was voluntary, that it was about voluntary contracts between women who received money up front in order to go to the war front during World War II and engage in voluntary sex work. And that at the end of the period where they had received the money up front and if they worked off the debt as an indentured servitude kind of contract, when that debt was worked off, whether it's in months or years, then they would be free to go. So that was his, his argument that the structure of the contract where you receive a high sum up front and then um, you work it off, that that itself revealed, that, help, that it helped to reveal the voluntary nature of these contracts. And so he um, had that 
that idea and he put it into the academic article that purported to use game theory and um, economic analysis. And he was ignoring the decades of history that historians had uncovered about these events. That's how I came to know about it when my students told me to take a look because they were getting ready to say something about it. They wanted to make a, a, a public statement and they, they wanted my advice. And that's how, that's how I got to know about it. By then, it already was uh, front page news in South Korea, that it had gone from being covered in Japan to South Korea, where it was being covered um, very prominently because it had to do with Harvard. And as some of your audience may know, Harvard all over the world, but especially in South Korea, has a certain kind of meaning. It has a certain status and um, one that definitely is going to make headlines. So if you're talking about comfort women, the issue of comfort women, and put that together with Harvard, clearly that's going to be um, get a lot of attention. And it did. And it was explosive. And, and people were very, very um, uh, concerned about it. And so I, I wanted to I wanted to take a close look. I did take a close look. I spent days just reading the work and making sure I really understood what my colleague was saying. And at the end of that, um, after a few days, I called him up, asked if we could have a conversation as colleagues. Um, and during the conversation, I told him, listen, we are in disagreement here and I fully respect your right to uh, produce scholarship, to express your opinion. You have different opinions than me that's okay. And we are going to have a public disagreement now, right? because I'm going to publish something that um, analyzes the article and just like scholars are supposed to do. And um, that's okay. I'm going to be approaching this as your colleague. Um, and that's what I told him. And then for the next three weeks, I worked on the article that I eventually did publish in the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. I think one of the uh, main claims that I've seen here, too, is that this uh, article is attempting to really overturn a kind of scholar scholarly consensus that had begun to be established on the history of the um, and critiques of the of the comfort woman uh, situation. And if one is going to do that, then one would have to marshal some new evidence uh, to try uh, to make those claims. So I know that in your article and in your um, work that you've also uh, closely analyzed the the evidence and the argument uh, that are presented in Professor Amzar's article. And I wonder if you could summarize, I know that this uh, issue was not just in the popular media, but it quickly attracted the attention of scholars uh, around the world, literally on, on what, four different uh, continents who quickly jumped into action and also uh, began to um, to look carefully over that evidence. So I wonder if you could just summarize a little bit just uh, the claims that uh, he's making and uh, based on uh, evidence that he uh, has in that article versus uh, the, the types of evaluation of that that have subsequently uh, happened. The really, um, the primary claim that he's making is that the comfort women entered into contracts and that the contracts had a certain structure and certain terms. And so what he says in the article, the, the scholarly article, is that the contract terms were ones that really had the shape of an indenture contract and that that meant that money was paid up front to the women, a large sum. And that after receiving the money, they would go um, to the war front voluntarily and then and then work off the debt and then they would be done and then free to go. So the that's the, the claim. The claim is that these were voluntary contractual arrangements in specifically specifically to refute the idea that these were forcible or coercive or um, enslavement type of arrangements um, where women were conscripted against their will to do this kind of work. That's that's really the the sum total of the the argument. Um, and the evidence that you would think was needed to make that argument was to actually say here, uh, you know, here's what's in the contracts. And this is why I think what I think, because the content of the contracts is one way or another way. And I analyze and interpret these contracts to have this meaning and those those be valid ways to proceed um i think about making an argument like this but i think that um when one reads ramsire's article 
one does get the impression that the footnotes are going to contain these contracts or at least some writing about them that would describe what the content of the contracts were or at least some kind of third party or secondary sources that would report on the content content of the contracts if it were the case that the contracts themselves were destroyed or were missing which of course sometimes happens that primary documents aren't there so that there would be some way of confirming what those contracts consisted of and so that's when one reads the paper certainly one thinks well he must have data of some kind and that's how he's making these uh interpretive arguments and so so interestingly, I think that when, as a, as a scholar, a legal scholar who does not know Japanese, who does not read Japanese sources, um, I was, I think that my situation approaching the article, it was a window really into what the legal scholars who might have engaged in peer review might have been going through. Because I went through that exact process where I said, oh, I want to know what the basis is for this argument. And of course, I did not have the ability myself, even though I know about law and I, and I certainly can analyze contracts and I can, um, do contractual analysis. That is part of the, the toolkit that, that I possess as a legal academic. Um, but I did not have the ability to read the Japanese sources or to even know exactly what sources were supporting what claims because they were in Japanese. So, um, at that point, um, and I'll just note before I go on that that is exactly probably how the peer reviewers were situated when, you know, the journal editors that who were of the law and economics journal that this was published in. And then also the, the, the people they may have sent it to, perhaps they sent it to Japanese specialists, but perhaps most likely not. Um, so at that point, of course, I, I turned to my colleagues in East Asian studies, um, Andrew Gordon and, Carter Eckert. And by that point, Carter and, and Andy had also been asked by the journal to review the article, perhaps with the eye to publishing a response in the journal itself. Because at that point, it was clear to the journal that the article was getting a lot of attention, um, negative attention, and that, that they probably they thought the responsible thing to do was to seek the opinions of scholars who might know a thing or two about the relevant history. Um, I too was asked to write a response, not because I know uh, Japanese, um, but because I am interested in these issues, both the sexual assault issues and sexual exploitation issues. And also I had published on Comfort Women previously, um, a dec maybe more than a decade ago. Mm -hmm. So so essentially I at that point, I, I, I drew on the expertise of, of scholarly colleagues who would have that expertise to try to, you know, to, to guide me. And luckily they also were already taking a, a close look. And then what happened was that as I was in conversation with them, they, um, they came to the conclusion through their study of the article that as they went to look at the sources, they concluded there weren't sources that would support these claims that Professor Ramsire was making. So in other words, they could not find in the sources, in the citations, any contracts with Korean women. Any contracts that appeared from the sources were contracts with Japanese women, um, either before the war or during the wartime period, but they were sample contracts with Japanese women for work that was called barmaid, which was understood apparently at that time to have a sexual connotation. Um, but there were no contracts with Korean women that were cited. And then there were also no secondary sources that would give one an insight into the content or the structure of any such contracts with Korean women, nor were there any third party accounts. So for example, any accounts by people who might have been there um, about these contracts that were cited. So there were there was essentially no data 
that they could see in the article that would support the claims about there being a contract and what the contract consisted of. Because I think when you read the article, you think, oh, he must know from sources that the contracts had this structure or that people were paid this much money for this amount of time and that it would spell out exactly what the nature of the work was. And I think that that um, professors Gordon and Eckert were very interested to see the contracts because they also knew that depending on the wording used, whether it, the wording was the word was prostitute or barmaid or comfort woman that would also determine what they thought about the voluntariness of the contract because they they observed that the word comfort the word the term comfort women during that period would not necessarily have revealed to people to an ordinary reader or an ordinary person um, in Japanese or Korean society at the time that the work was of a sexual nature. Uh, so they, they so they were very eager to see exactly what the, the contract said, um, but they found that they could not see what the contract said because there were no contracts to read, um, at least according to the sources, and they themselves did not know of other sources that would give insight into the content of the contracts. So basically, at that point, I think that they they determined, they concluded on their own, and then they told me, that they were sending a letter. They, I think they had already sent it by the time I talked to them. Um, the, the letter said that there was a problem of academic integrity that was prior to um, any other issues they could criticize about the article so that they could not uh, really write a substantive response um, to the article's arguments because they could not themselves analyze the data that they believed ought to be there if one were to make that kind of argument. Um, so they, they, I think that that's, that's where they landed by the time I had spoken with them, that they had come to that conclusion as scholars trying to trace the sources and, and interpret the contracts for themselves. Mm -hmm. So that, that, was the, that was kind of the first stage of my realizing that this was not necessarily a story about, um, you know, moral outrageousness of okay. argument or about being, you know, about Korea versus Japan or about, um, you know, how dare you call, you know, call comfort women prostitutes. I, I, I just think all of that was really not, yeah. not, re not really front and center right now that the main issue was just where, where did he get the, evidence to make the argument. And if yeah, there yeah. wasn't sufficient evidence or any really that would support the argument, then that that's, that's something people ought to know about yeah. the article. And I think that was, that was the approach or that was the conclusion of our colleagues, um, Andrew Gordon and, and, and Carter. Yeah. Hunter. I mean, one of the things that really struck me about uh, reading uh, all of the different responses that I've been able to read thus far is that given such a potentially emotive issue, the responses have been extremely level-headed and in fact uh, lacking in any vitriol, um, but really focused on the evidence um, and the argument uh, that's presented there. And I know that there were, in addition to Professors Eckert and Gordon, um, that uh, that there were scholars working on, you know, around the world. Again, I know uh, Professor Amy Stanley at Northwestern was uh, lead author of a paper that had people in in the UK, Singapore, uh, the US, and also Japan, uh, and also Alexis Dudden at University of Connecticut and Tessa Morris Suzuki in Australia. And I was just curious. It seemed to be that they were um, doing their assessments and research uh, largely in isolation of each other. Maybe Maybe perhaps knowing that each of them was going to issue some response, but but it, what were working uh, in their own ways uh, to assess that evidence. And I was wondering, um, are there were they arriving at similar or overlapping issues of concern um, in the reports that they issued? All of the reports that that you have read and that that I um, that I uh, reported on in my article in the New Yorker were being worked on simultaneously, and perhaps there was some. Um, there, there was some information being shared about the findings as they went along, but ultimately really it was each individual scholar doing the work. And then Amy Stanley's group, um, Amy Stanley at Northwestern, her group consisted of her and four other 
scholars scattered across various continents. And Tessa Moore Suzuki in Australia was doing her work uh, alone. And um, I think Tessa's uh, work was not known, the content of it wasn't known until the actual letter was um, sent to the journal and then made available to several scholars who were also concerned about this. And, um, and the thing that they had in common was this finding of a lack of evidence in, in the first instance for the, for the claims, uh, the missing contracts, I guess is the big headline, but the also, also the um, fact that when things were cited, often they were cited in a way that was plainly contrary to what the source actually said. So that the, that sometimes the statement would read one way, and then when you went to the source, as again, they had the ability to do so because they're readers of Japanese, they found that it said the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, and that sometimes, and that that happened multiple times in very key, very relevant ways. So it wasn't just sort of a throwaway comment that might be inaccurately cited, but rather really central, really claims that were central, statements that were central to the argument itself. If you went to the source, then you would see that it would say the opposite. So some really, really key points, one of them had to do with um, Professor Ramsar used the example of a 10-year-old girl named Osaki who had written um, her first person, who had reported her first person account of having been um, gone to having gone to Borneo to be a prostitute at age ten, that she had been recruited at that age, and and Professor Ramsayer wrote his his article stated that even at age ten, she knew what the work entailed. So even at age 10, she knew what the work entailed. This is a Japanese 10-year-old uh, girl. And he was using that point, that statement, to kind of slide into the idea that if even at age 10, you know what the work entailed, then th these Korean women also um, would know what the work entailed and therefore would be doing it in a voluntary manner, just like Osaki who at age 10 knew what the work entailed. So um, there, it was very, for me, as somebody who works on the legal issue of sexual assault, um, and I was a you know, former prosecutor um, of child abuse and, and domestic violence, I, 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 I kind of did a double take because I just thought, well, isn't there, there's no, there was no discussion at all of a 10 year old and their ability or inability um, to consent to sex. Um, and so that in itself was, uh, kind of a big red flag, um, given that, that, that it was being discussed for the purpose of proving that women entered into contracts voluntarily. So I think that in itself, it, it almost said it all, um, that, that sentence. But then the scholars, the Japanese study scholars found uh, Amy Stanley's group um, found that when you went to the um, source, it was the Sandakan, they found that the source said the opposite, that the girl reported uh, not knowing what the work entailed. In fact, that she was terrified, that she didn't realize that this was the kind of work that she was um, recruited without being told what was happening to her. And um, so that was a very, very striking example, I think, of sources not saying what he was claiming they were saying. There were um, many other examples that were detailed in a 35-page document by Amy Stanley, and also some other examples by Tessa Moore Suzuki in her letter. The essential nub of it, as I think uh, Professor Moore Suzuki found, was that Professor Ramsire had written an article 30 years before about Japanese pre-war prostitution contracts. Um, those were also indenture servitude contracts that he was writing about. And he was making the case that those contracts were voluntary as opposed to sex slavery. Um, and he, um, he, you know, those, those were pre-war Japanese prostitution contracts. And then he um, had essentially taken those insights 
and claims about voluntariness and kind of grafted them on to the situation of Korean women uh, being conscripted into uh, sexual sex work during the war. And, and uh, Professor Morris Suzuki's observation was just that it just was a, kind of a grafting of one one context onto another with no justification for making that leap because you would need additional evidence about Korean women and their contracts if you were going to make even the same argument that you were able to make um, using Japanese indenture contracts. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that was, that, that was the, I think the insight of professor Moore Suzuki looking, looking at it all uh, that, that that's, clearly what had happened. And so when I spoke with Mark Ramsayer, um, because I wasn't going to write this article without keeping him in the loop about the findings um, and about just his thoughts, I wanted to know his thoughts as, as we were going through this process, because I knew that he was being emailed by various parties um, asking for clarification. I know that there was a student group at Harvard Law School who was trying to track down the sources. And I know that he was engaging in uh, in conversation with them about his sources. So it was, it was something that I thought as colleagues we could talk about. And when I did talk to him and this is reported in my New Yorker article, he, he, he said, no, I, I don't have Korean contracts. And I don't think that he, he thought that that was particularly damning because, and I can understand that point of view that, that you don't need to have the actual physical contracts to know that contracts existed. I mean, often the work of historians is to try to figure out um, as much as one can based on the evidence that does exist, even though through time, some evidence may have disappeared. Mm -hmm. So you can use other evidence to um, glean information and to make inferences and interpretations. And so perhaps that's what he thought he was doing, that in the absence of the actual contracts, that there might be other evidence. And so that's what I was interested in, to know what other evidence he had that um, allowed him to make conclusions about the structure of the contracts. And it, I think that um, it was confusing to me because he seemed to think that he did have such evidence, but the historians did not find any. Um, after really scouring all the sources, they did not find any. Um, there was like, a piece here and there, but each time it would kind of slip through your fingers because they were contracts about Japanese women, or they were contracts from before the war, um, not in the wartime context, and, or anything having to do with comfort women, um, and certainly nothing that described the work as, you know, comfort women work. Um, so it does, I don't conclude, and I don't think the historians do, that there couldn't have been contracts. Mm -hmm. It's really more just, you know, if you're going to say what the contracts consist of, there should be some basis for it. I mean, this is the this is how academia works and um, building on previous scholarship, uh, adding new evidence, uh, assessing that evidence. And I think at this point, then, you know, probably uh, people will come through the evidence that's marshaled in the uh, reports that the that these academics have compiled as well. I think that would be uh, just fine to look all of that over as well and then make uh, informed decisions about uh, how how one weighs the evidence. Um, that's all part of what we do as academics. Um, I wonder if we could just turn the table slightly, though, and say, you know, that, yes, uh, there have been some uh, high profile uh, critiques that were out there, but there have also, I think we should acknowledge, been some letters of support that have circulated, um, sometimes through email and other means. Uh, I've been the recipient of, of some of those. And I just wonder if you could uh, characterize uh, some of those um, and, and the, the nature of the support uh, for uh, Professor Ramsire's article. Sure. Yeah. The, um, so Professor Ramsar, I think, did did receive some public support. One was from a group of Japanese um, individuals at Japanese institutions, and they um, described themselves as historians. And they said that they stand behind um, Professor Ramsar's academic integrity and really encouraged him to keep keep on with it. And and that it was a short public letter. Um, by those Japanese uh, individuals, and they they um, consist of one who is a historian, uh, a professional historian at a university, and the rest um, are not academic historians in that sense. 
but they, you know, certainly engage in historical inquiry. Um, and they, most of them are affiliated with a Japanese organization that is dedicated to, um, apparently denying, um, Japanese atrocities, particularly during World War II, including the Nanjing Massacre. So it, it, there, that is a purpose of the group that they are affiliated with. Um, another group of individuals were 15 Korean individuals in South Korea who spoke up and wrote a public letter in support of Professor Ramsire. And they, they, they consist of various, you know, sort of academics or former academics who have been active on the comfort women issue and have had similar views to Professor Ramsire in the past. And, um, and some of them are, you know, right wing figures who are, uh, who have formed a new political party, kind of departing from the main conservative political party in South Korea, who, and then um, several of them co authored a, a very um, high profile book called Anti Japan Tribalism in, in Korea, which was published in 2019. And it that book also makes the argument that the comfort women um, sex slavery story is a lie. Um, so I think that that many of the people um, on that list had some background with um, uh, taking similar positions as Professor Ramsire on, on the comfort women issue. And some um, are just, it's kind of a, a an amalgamation of, of various, various different uh, groups that I had not heard of before. But um, yeah, so they, they published that. And in addition, I think that early, early on in early February, when, um, when Professor Ramsire uh, was just starting to be criticized um, in the media, um, and maybe a few scholars had already written to the journal to ask for a retraction, um, and I think that many people assumed because we, we had we, we didn't have the benefit of the scholars careful work yet because it took time. It took mm -hmm. weeks for them to do. We hadn't had that benefit yet. Um, it, I think it was easy for people to assume this was about expressing an unpopular opinion and how it was important to stick up for academic freedom in the face of somebody who's saying something that you or I might find uh, disagreeable. But certainly we would think as part of a university um, setting that one one should have the, the freedom to say things that people very, very strongly find, um, find objectionable. Um, and so I think it was in that vein that several scholars, I believe, um, that learned about this controversy from Professor Ramsire were, um, were writing, writing letters to the journal itself to say, I support Professor Ramsire's work. And I think it is really, really um, of a high standard. So, so there was one Japanese historian of the 16th and 17th centuries and one um, professor of e Japanese economics. Um, and th those colleagues wrote letters that were supportive of him saying that the, the research is good. Um, and that, that academic journals should be publishing things even when they're very uh, unpopular or even distressing to people. And I think that after the historians did their careful work, um, their reports were available online. And at that point, um, I shared them with those scholars just because I was writing this article and I wanted to be fair and make sure that if they were supportive that I, I said so, but I didn't want to blindside them by not giving them a, you know, a heads up about what the historians had done. I didn't think they'd, they would necessarily have known about it because it wasn't reported yet. So I did share those with them just so that we could get their full considered view. And they did um, report back to me that um, basically what they said was, one of them said that this, these are very powerful reports and that that Professor Ramsire should re respond to them and admit error if appropriate. And the other one said that um, if the editors of the journal realized after the fact that their, their process had failed to catch serious errors 
um, in the representation of facts, then um, a retraction would be appropriate. But this is really, I think, an important part of this uh, uh, whole issue. And I think your the title of your New Yorker piece, I think, uh, is is really uh, pointed in in terms of addressing that particular issue about seeking the truth of the comfort women, right? Tr- seeking the true story, right? So uh, it seemed to me that in those uh, the letters of support that came, um, and and then in the academic responses too, the two key issues that came up: one side calling for academic freedom, and the other side calling for academic integrity. And we need to be really clear on those two things. Uh, and I think that's perhaps one of the reasons why uh, the academic responses were um, were so uh, um, level-headed in the way they addressed it. They, they went uh, particularly to uh, the issues of academic integrity um, while still supporting academic freedom, I think. Is that, do you think that's accurate as a, um, an assessment of what, what this calls out for as making really clear on those two issues? I think you're right. And I think that that's true. That was deeply motivating to me because I also, in in another um, guise, I, I'm i not only an academic and, and a writer, I also am someone who is an advocate for academic freedom. And I have very strongly in the past and will continue to defend academic freedom of scholars and uh, any members of the university, um, w- even with views that are extremely unpopular and views that I very strongly disagree with, I will I will still defend um, the academics' right to explore those ideas and to express those opinions and views. And so it was it, having that as my kind of um, I guess that was you know just a credo that that I have that it's very important that even if people disagree with it, that it, people have the freedom to be able to explore the ideas. That's kind of what a university is for. Um, and it, and if there's debunking to be done, if everyone believes one thing but it's not the truth, a university is exactly where you would hope that that kind of inquiry would be possible, and that you wouldn't be shot down for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's very important to me, and I do I do think that what came across in the scholars' um, work was that that was very important to them as well. That act and that this important refinement, which is that academic freedom doesn't mean the freedom to either uh, make things up or say things that are without support when making a factual claim, particularly about a historical event um, on which so many people have reflected and, and that has this kind of meaning. Um, I think that it's, uh, do untrue claims come out of academics' mouths? Of course they do. And they might not get the kind of scrutiny that this one did, but it is, um, it, it is because the, the issue is so important that it's gotten that scrutiny, but nevertheless, the scrutiny has revealed that this is not an issue of, we disagree with your opinion. It's an issue of, is there any factual basis for making the claim, which I think is a kind of bare minimum requirement for academics. Maybe not for other people who might spout off on Twitter or make statements wherever, But I think for academics, we have a certain um, minimum standard when we're making um, claims about facts and claims about the past. Um, We're not just, sometimes we express opinions on which tons of people can disagree, whether reasonably or not. But sometimes I think it's pretty clear that we are making statements about what happened or what is true and what 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 is factual. Um, and it is very clear when you're reading Professor Ramsire Ar- Ramsire's article that he's not saying, well, if there were contracts, then it would be this way or that way. He's saying there were contracts and the contracts consisted of this structure. And so mm-hmm. those are factual claims that I think that, that have to be backed up by evidence because we're academics. You know, we're not just, you know, anyone walking around on the streets, like saying whatever we want. We have a responsibility as academics, scholars who people trust to be able to produce knowledge 
Um, and that baseline level of trust, I think, is frayed when um, these statements are made and then other academics do nothing about it. Um, and, and so I, I really think the historians who did this work, you know, they didn't, they didn't want to take almost a month out of their, their busy schedule. I mean, I, I know that at least some of them were on sabbatical. They had projects that they were uh, scheduled to do. I had other articles that I was thinking that I needed to write, and I'm still behind on one of them um, you know, because of the time that it took to really look at this. But it takes time. That's what scholarship is. It takes time. And they did a service to our profession as academics by really carefully going over it because it really is about a matter of trust. The public trusts us, our students trust us, and the university trusts us to um, make knowledge possible through certain standard procedures that are aimed to get at the truth. When we deviate from that, it's the responsibility of our colleagues to look at it and point out to us how we might have gone wrong. And so as far as I'm concerned, even though I feel badly for all the time that was lost in, uh, in terms of the scholars doing, not being able to do the work that they were planning to do um, during those weeks, it, it really was a, it was a public service that they chose to do it, and um, and it was vitally important to going forward for demonstrating to ourselves and to the public that we really care about claims being made responsibly and having factual bases for the claims that we make. I mean, I think this is one of the real key issues that came out of this. And also, I mean, particularly a bar that's set pretty high then for, particularly if you're uh, attempting to overturn uh, uh, an academic consensus that's built up through hard work over many, many decades, actually about a particular uh, topic and uh, all the more reason uh, to be extra careful and, and uh, diligent in the research and the citation uh, to make those claims. I wonder if you wouldn't mind just finally, um, I know that you've also been paying attention to uh, the uh, way that this story, not just the article itself, but also the story has traveled uh, to East Asia, um, particularly to Japan and Korea. Uh, if you would be able to say uh, a few things about that. And then uh, finally, if you perhaps related to that question, uh, could say a little something about what you think the longer term impact of this uh, might be our present moment in uh, dealing with this uh, controversial topic. And will it, do you think it could have some uh, longer term impact on this evolving uh, debates and controversies over the comfort women issue that's been going on for, uh, for decades now? Uh, will it have any impact there? As you say, it, this is a controversy that has been really kind of red hot for decades. Um, and in some ways for 70 years, mm -hmm. there has been conflict in some way um, or another around it. Just the, the whole cycle of uh, blame, recrimination, apology, denial, all of that just repeated again and again um, in the in the Korea-Japan relationship with the United States as kind of this, almost like this mediator middleman who wants the two countries to really be able to work together because it's vitally important to the U.S. national security interest, as well as just the, the making sure that um, that region is stable and that the democracies can be allies effectively. Um, so I think that that has been um, an ongoing it's been ongoing for decades, but in the most recent iteration, there was an agreement in 2015 between Korea and Japan that agreed that this issue was resolved, um, that the comfort women would receive compensation from Japan paid into a Korean fund and that Japan and that uh, actually Prime Minister Abe would apologize. He did um, issue an apology in the as part of the agreement. And then, um, and then the issue would be done and resolved. And that was what, what the parties each said. But then, of course, you know, I can see from the Japanese side that it would be very frustrating 
to have apologized like that, not only that time, but in their view, many times, and it to have it not be done because then it's reopened again because there was a court case in January in Seoul that uh, ordered Japan to pay compensation and to apologize. So it's just... I can see from that side that it is extremely frustrating and that it's like, it'll never be done because the Koreans will never be satisfied. On the other hand, in Korea, the view is that, well, Japan will speaks this way out of one side of its mouth, but in the end, they're, they're not really sincere. And then they're always backtracking from the, from their position. And so there's that sense of like, you know, uh, lack of satisfaction. And so it's just this dynamic that's been going on for a long time. And then you've got this Ramsire issue in 2021 suddenly um, getting in the midst of all of that. And it, and it has, it's, it's combustible because the mm-hmm. setup is already there for mutual distrust on both sides. And it only seems to confirm, um, confirm the worst on the South Korean side. It's like, oh, here's this professor who is, you know, affiliated with uh Japanese studies and is like basically saying the denialist right wing position of Japan um that perhaps isn't even ma- mainstream in Japan but it's 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 that kind of extreme denialism and then in Japan of course some some parts of J- Japanese society have embraced the Ramsar position to the extent that they think their government has been too too soft on Korea mm-hmm. Right. So um, it's just getting right in the middle of all of that. Um, and then to the extent that the U.S. government right now, uh, the, the press secretary, the White House press secretary has been asked about the Ramsire article twice in the past weeks, um, specifically with respect to the geopolitical situation in Asia, um, because, of course, it's very important for Korea and Japan to work with the United States. And if they're kind of not able to see eye to eye or at least you know feel resolved it's you know th- that could be that could be a real problem and and the comfort women issue for whatever reason that has been the sticking point right mm-hmm. what would, would be called these history issues that has been the sticking point and so i so i think that in a way there's some optimism here in the fact that korea south korea and north korea have um both denounced the Ramsire article and um, the U S state department has come out very clearly um, not specifically referencing the article, but just saying that these were wartime atrocities and, you know, just standing behind the historical findings that, that we have been familiar with. And I think that that was a significant thing for the U S to, the State Department spokesman to have done in the midst of all of this. So, I mean, the one thing that's coming out of it is that more and more people are aware Mm -hmm. of the issue. And perhaps it will end up being more resolved after the Ramsire incidents because so many people have had to think about it and then reaffirm the historical findings with the help of the historians who have um, looked into it again. So... I don't know. I, I, I would like to be optimistic in terms of what's going to happen um, in terms of the uh, resol- resolving of the historical conflict and conflicts about truth. Yeah. I mean, I think that the uh, the ending very final part of your article, which uh, cites one of the uh, comfort women survivors that ends in a very poignant kind of way of just saying, you know, maybe something good will come out of this because it stirred up the discussion and forced people uh, to grapple with this. And, and, um, and I think that uh, clearly there's a lot of uh, discussion going on. Uh, it's a very complex issue. I think you're, uh, I'd like to, first of all, just thank you for the article that you wrote for the New Yorker, which is uh, clear, uh, comprehensive, uh, and, and help to summarize really the, um, and cover uh, the situation as it stands, both uh, in reception in, in uh, Japan and Korea, but also as academics have grappled with this uh, important issue. Um, and finally, just thank you very much for taking the time today uh, to discuss this uh, topic and the complex issues surrounding it. And I appreciate it very much. So thank you. Thank you, James. Mm-hmm.